Islands. Surrounded by water, they come in all shapes, climates, sizes, and distances from the mainland. Many islands, particularly tropical ones, are associated with sun, white sand beaches, azure waters, and relaxation. However, islands are also often quite strange places. If you bother to get off your pool chair and really look at the organisms that inhabit them, even a spit of land right next to a continent might feel a little off. One species relatively uncommon on the mainland might be everywhere on an island, while others are completely absent. The further you go from continents, though, the stranger island organisms become. So what oddities might inhabit the world's most remote chain of islands? The Hawaiian Islands. And what makes islands have such weird fauna? Hello, everyone. So um, Argus responded to my previous video um, after I honestly was quite nice to, to Argus's video, um, I thought. I just said the video on how to survive volcanoes was a bit bare bones um, to actually educate and inform people on the best way to survive a volcano or volcanic eruption. Anyway, the comment reads, uh, let's see, I'll find it here. Hello, Ecotasia. I don't think you have any standing to discuss this topic. Are you a volcanologist? It would have been really helpful if you did some additional research beforehand to provide more comprehensive feedback. Also, your voice is annoying. Uh, that's kind of rude. Um, that's kind of rude. Um, and like, I will admit, I only really did the bare minimum um, to add some, the bare minimum to sort of add on to the topic um, to sort of make it educational for the average viewer. Anyway, I have decided to pick a different video this time from Argus. This is the top five most dangerous and mysterious islands in the world. I'm sure there will be plenty to rip apart with this one. Ahoy there, honeymooners. Looking for an island getaway? Unfortunately, not all islands are so ideal for sun, sand, and relaxation. From mysterious disappearances to deadly creatures, we're about to embark on a journey to some of the most fascinating and frightening places on Earth. So remember to pack your sunscreen and swimsuit as we explore the world's most dangerous and strangest islands. I, I kind of just want to dance to that music. Um, but anyway, I kind of find this video significantly more irritating than the last. Number five, Bikini Atoll. Starting off at number five, we have Bikini Atoll, located in the Pacific Ocean. This island is famous for its nuclear testing during the Cold War, and it remains one of the most radioactive places on Earth. Number four. So, um, yeah, uh, Bikini Atoll is radioactive, but like people go scuba diving on Bikini Atoll. It's like a tourist destination for a group for some people. Also, this video really just didn't do justice to some of the darker aspects of Bikini Atoll history, um, specifically in preparation for the US military to play around with nukes. They forcibly removed the entire native population of Bikini um, Islanders and dumped them on an island that didn't really have any enough fresh water for them. Um, now, someone one might sound now, Technically, I could see that someone in the comments getting upset with this. Yes, technically, the Bikini Islanders did agree to go, um, but they were kind of tricked by the U.S. military saying the tests would end all wars. Like, they're kind of guilt tripped into it. Like, this is going to end all the wars. And, and the Bikini Islanders are like, OK, we'll we'll sacrifice our land for that, uh, which the which no, the the testing of nuclear weapons did not end war. Um, and unfortunately, Bikini Islanders are probably never going to inhabit their homeland again. Um, yeah, which is very unfortunate and sad. North Sentinel Island. Oh no, not North Sentinel Island. At number Island. four, we have North Sentinel Island, home to one of the last uncontacted tribes in the world. The island is protected by the Indian government that looks fake. and considered too dangerous for outsiders to visit, as the tribe is known to attack anyone who comes near. So if you're looking for a peaceful island getaway, this probably isn't it. Uh, I, well, 
it's illegal and very disrespectful to go to that island uh, because in reality, the Sentinelese have been contacted. Uh, the Brits visited the island and kidnapped some of the natives. And then after India um, became independent from the, from the British Empire, um, they visited the, um, the island a few times and actually made peaceful contact with the, the North Sentinelese. Now, nobody outside of that island really understands the language, um, but the anthropologists and stuff were able to figure out basically that um, the, the North Sentinelese were basically told them not to overstay their welcome. And so they're not so much an un uncontacted tribe as a group of indigenous people in voluntary isolation. They wish, they wish not to be disturbed by our helicopters and boats. Um, and they have made that very clear, both peacefully and with spears. Um, who can blame them after all, though, because of how bad colonialism has messed up cultures around the world? Number three, Miyakejima Island. Next, we have Miyakejima Island, located in Japan. This island is home to one of the world's most active volcanoes, Mount Oyama and residents must wear gas masks at all times to protect themselves from the toxic gas emissions. So if you're looking for a relaxing island honeymoon destination with breathable air, maybe not the best choice. So um, this makes this island seem uninhabitable, but it's not. And the whole gas mask thing is actually overstated. Residents um, didn't have to wear them at all times like they sort of implied. And nowadays, they don't even do that, have gas masks with them at all times anymore, um, because there's all sorts of alarms in case of volcanic um, emissions that are being tracked. And I mean, you can just like get to the island with like a ferry from Tokyo. So like, like maybe you should have your honeymoon here. I don't know. Yeah, I, I way overstated of how dangerous that island is. Number two, Easter Island. Coming in at number two, we have Easter Island, known for its mysterious statues and unexplained history. The past is shrouded in mystery and the Rapa Nui people who once inhabited it remain a subject of much speculation and intrigue. Um, the Rapa Nui people still inhabit Easter Island, or as it's more correctly called, Rapa Nui. And despite what someone like Jared Diamond, uh, what some like Jared Diamond have contended, they were probably perfectly self-sufficient when Europeans arrived. Yes, the arrival of the, the islanders likely led to the extinction of the land birds and the giant native palm tree, either directly or indirectly through the introduction of Polynesian rats. But the total ecological collapse that characterizes um, Rapa Nui today didn't really occur until after European colonization. So yeah, they thought the best use of this island was for ranching. And actually one half of the uh, Rapa Nui population was captured and enslaved. Um, after all that crap, yeah, the island's only endemic land animals are some cave springtails. And the native plants have not fared very well, but it has probably nothing to do with the construction of the Moai statues, which after centuries of conjecture, some anthropologists finally asked the Rapa Nui, who showed them how they moved the statues. Uh, I really would like to go there someday. They have a really unique... Um, endemic fish community like um, and reef system um, below, which would be really cool to visit. Um, but yeah, um, that was, this is just embarrassing what they, what this video said about Easter Island. Okay, let's see what number one is. Number one, Snake Island. Finally, at number one, we have Isla de Kiamata Grande, also known as Snake Island. This island is home That's a to thousands of deadly golden lancehead vipers and is considered That's one of the most dangerous places on earth. So if That's you're another rattlesnake. Snakes, it's probably not the best vacation destination. Ha uh ha. -huh. Uh, it's also illegal to visit, 
both for the safety of people and the critically endangered golden lanceheads. There are some reports, uh, four reports of bites happening and three were fatal, but lanceheads, the group that this um, pit viper is a part of, um, are some of the most dangerous snakes in the neotropics. And I feel like this very brief overview of of them kind of makes them out as like monsters um, and not these really cool like bird specialist vipers that like they have this potent venom to take down migrating birds and they only need to eat one or two birds a year, which is like incredible. I think, and I think like that really speaks to like when we focus on, on fear and like the terror of something, we kind of lose sight of how amazing some organisms like really are. And I think that's just sad. Well, there you have it, folks. The five strangest and most dangerous islands in the world. Who knows, maybe one day you'll be brave enough to visit one of these mysterious places. But until then, don't forget to like and subscribe for more content like this. Okay, so I am definitely less of a fan of this video than the last video. Um, this is just kind of bad, missing so much critical information that I feel only barely got to a point that could be considered educational with my like additional commentary. Like this video is terrible. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, on with this video. Millions of years ago, deep sea volcanoes erupted out of the central Pacific. At first, they were lifeless mountains of volcanic rock. Then over time, life arrived and colonized these lands, forming a community of organisms from scratch, not tied to millions of years of competition with other species. Thus, evolution took some of these arrivals in exciting new and sometimes disconcerting directions. Among the native vegetation on the crater rim of the active volcano Kilauea lurks an ambush predator. Fortunately, this organism, which could easily be in some horrible asylum or sci-fi original movie, is so tiny and well camouflaged, most humans simply walk by. But for small arthropods, this animal can quickly end their lives. On the edge of a leaf, this creature waits until they can grab a hapless fancy Hawaiian fruit fly or some other small insect in their long legs. A carnivorous inchworm, Eupithecia. How did such a thing arise? Well, based on the habits of some close relatives who still have the more typical vegan diet of other caterpillars, we can get some hints. The vegan inchworms feed on the protein-rich pollen of flowers, and so one can imagine some pollen-feeding caterpillar that inadvertently caught insects coming to feed on the nectar, and those with longer legs were more effective at catching prey, eventually evolving the almost skeleton hand-looking legs of the modern carnivorous species. Well, why are predatory inchworms really just a thing in Hawaii and not everywhere? Well, because Hawaii basically started from scratch, the normal competitors and predators of inchworms were not really present when some moths got blown to the island. With less pressure from predation and adjacent ecological niches left empty, herbivorous caterpillars could transition into ambush predators. The wide open availability of niches allowed the evolution of some very strange organisms on Hawaii. Organisms arrive and can diversify to fill many adjacent niches, which is why Hawaii has so many fruit flies, each with their own special wing patterns to impress mates, about a hundred species of these colorful longhorn beetles, or finches trying to be hummingbirds or woodpeckers. While this availability of niches may help explain why species get weird on islands, it really doesn't explain the patterns of which species arrive on any particular island. To explain this better, I want to find a specific species that is the descendant of some expert world travelers. Now, when I talk about an organism that can travel to an island as remote as these, you might be thinking that this animal needs to be a powerful flyer, or perhaps a really good swimmer. But this animal and their continental ancestors are neither. Unfortunately, they are even harder to find than the well-hidden carnivorous caterpillars lying in ambush that might eat them. 
To find this creature, I need to look at the underside of basically every leaf in the forest. Bingo. The Nananana Makaki'i, or the Hawaiian Happy Face Spider. These spiders are known for their wide range of abdomen patterns that look something like a smiling emoji, I guess, or at least an attempt to draw a face on a balloon. They are surprisingly gentle for spiders, caring for young that are incapable of feeding themselves after hatching, even adopting spiderlings from other broods, and cannibalism among the young has not been observed. To perhaps some of your surprise and horror of arachnophobes everywhere, the presence of spiders in Hawaii is a testament to how good they are at traveling vast distances through the air. Spiderlings often will send out a line of silk that catches the wind or Earth's electromagnetic field and sends them skyward. While most spiders don't go very far, some can reach the jet stream and travel the planet but they still have to find land and not get lost out in the 70% of Earth that is covered by water. This is where the theory of island biogeography comes in, which models how species arrive and colonize islands. I could explain it using graphs from a textbook or something, but that's boring. So let me explain it in the most college way ever, by using a game of beer pong. Hello everyone, I'm here to explain island biogeography using red solo cups and ping pong balls. So I've set these red solo cups up in such a way that we have one closer to me, one in the middle of this table, and one more by you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to throw ping pong balls into these red solo cups. Um, I represent the mainland, um, and each red solo cup represents an island, and the, re and the ping pong ball represents a species trying to get to that island. So, um, let's see, I think I've, I'm very bad at throwing, but... In the middle. No. I'm just gonna keep tossing these. <laughs> I'm really bad at this. I wasn't even... But anyway, as I toss these, you have to imagine, like, as you're trying to throw them, the distance and storms and, like, the nutrition of the animal sorts of runs out. So, as you try, oh, I did it! I did it! I got one in! I'm so excited. I have no sports skills. Okay, let's see if we can get in that next one. No. Nope. Try and get the far one. No. Oh, that one bounced over two of them. That was cool. Oh, I should have been going for the far one. Oh, I got one in the far one! That's awesome! Let's see if I can get another one in there. It's been in like multiple times, so... It might, that island's just full up on, uh, on organisms. There's no more niches available. Nope. Nope. Whoa! Oh, we got three! We got three! Woo! Oh, we got one in there! Yeah! Okay, we used the ball of our balls. Um, what the basics are, so we have three in here, two in there, and one in here. What I just demonstrated was the distance effect. The closer an island is, the more species are likely to get to it. And so we can see that it was, you know, I eventually got three in there. It was a little difficult because I kept on bouncing out. But I did get two in there, and somehow I got one in the far one. I think... That was an accident. Um, we'll have to look at the relook at the footage. But I'm pretty sure it was a complete accident that I got it in there. But it ended up perfect. Three, two, one. Like perfect. Like mathematically. Like if I was to fake this, which I didn't, this is what it would look like. And to show you, I've just demonstrated demonstrated highly complex math with beer pump. Wow! Isn't science great? Okay, but that's not the only way that, um, that aspects of an island dictate how a species goes in there. So we've done distance effect, 
but now we need to do a different effect of island. So now that we've talked about the distance effect, it's time to talk about a different effect that dictates island biogeography, and that is the effect of size of an island. So these red solo cups are all the same size, so they don't really show that. So we need to do something else, and I have with me a little tiny red solo cup, a mini red solo cup, and that one we can just we can just pour some of this delicious lemonade. It's not lemonade, it's water with uh, food coloring. But we need a bigger one. Now, I, they probably make a bigger red Solo cup because we live in a capitalist society where there's just a bunch of things we don't really need. But I don't happen to own one of those. So instead, let's go with a five gallon bucket. This feels disgusting. Um, I feel like I am doing bro science. Which is fine, which is fine, there's nothing against bro science. But I like feel before a minute, before long it'll be like a mechanical shark and we'll like throw it at a watermelon or something. If you've ever seen the, the absolute classic Shark Week episode, Anatomy of a Shark Bite. I'm gonna go fill this up with hose water because it's like there's no water in there. Ugh! Didn't fill this up all the way, thank goodness. I'm not that strong. This looks ridiculous, right? <laughs> It looks silly. I have like a little tiny one and the big one, the medium, the normal one, and then a five gallon bucket. But this will really demonstrate the effective size islands have. If I get it in the little one, that will be the greatest, like, like the greatest athletic feat of all time. So once again, I am playing the mainland and I have a species and they're going to travel and they're going to head for the big island. Oh, that was <laughs> Okay, the medium one. No, and the little one. <laughs> I'm gonna knock it over. <laughs> Let's go big one. I missed it. I'm actually sh surprised. Okay, medium one. Oh, too much. And little one. Oh, it's just a war of attrition. Okay, um, big one. Should just like try to do a weird one. Oh, look, I'm... <laughs> Now I'm trying to throw it, that's bad. I just want one in the medium one. And, fuck. What the, that was the coolest thing I've ever done. Not really, but that was cool. What the? Missed it. See how it ends. Whoopee. Sunk it. <laughs> now you get a drink. No, don't drink it. It's disgusting in there. Um, so yeah, so we got zero in the tiny cup. That wasn't a big surprise. One in the normal red solo cup and five in the bucket. I'll, I'll show you this, but that is the effect of size on islands. Is a big island is more likely to capture species than a medium or small island. And once again, I have illustrated complex math with ping pong balls and red solo cups and a five gallon bucket from the Home Depot. Okay, so we have our, our little tiny cup and it's like nothing in there. We got the one in the normal red solo cup and we got a whole bucket, a whole bucket of ping pong balls. That was fun. Well, there you go. That's island biogeography. Islands, while a place for the weird and wonderful to evolve and thrive, are also quite vulnerable, especially when new arrivals are highly competitive or arrive en masse. Throughout time, island ecosystems have been devastated when they are connected to the mainland. Even millions of years ago, during the time of dinosaurs, a dwarf Brachiosaurus-like dinosaur, Europasaurus, living on an island that is today part of Germany, likely went extinct when mainland carnivores, larger than the tiny long neck, arrived across a land bridge. Today, humans with an unprecedented ability to travel with intention to even the most remote islands can disrupt these ecosystems and the conditions that led to such strange forms of life, and a new threat to arthropods lurks among the vegetation, a creature that looks like some sort of prehistoric holdover from the Cretaceous, well camouflaged. Able to change color and move in a way to mimic leaves blowing in the wind, this beast, like the inchworm, is an ambush predator, 
though able to grab unsuspecting prey, like this colorful koa bug, from a great distance with pinpoint accuracy, using an extendable tongue. We will have to keep our eyes peeled for this terror of the forest, searching for one basking in the foliage along the side of a road. Hello, I'm in the town of Volcano on the big island of Hawaii, and I am in the process of herping. I am, I'm looking for some reptiles, which naturally, ecologically shouldn't be possible because Hawaii is so far away from any other landmass that there are no native terrestrial reptiles. There are sea turtles in the ocean, but they're not up here on the summit of Kilauea. Um, but over the past century, really, and really in the past couple decades, more and more reptiles have been introduced and have sort of expanded um, across the islands of Hawaii. And right now, I'm searching for the most spectacular, the Jackson's Chameleon. I just found a chameleon. It's a uh, Jackson's Chameleon. This is a Jackson's Chameleon. Uh, I don't usually do a oh, catch and present, but this I've wanted to do for a while. But yeah, so this is a Jackson's Chameleon. They are not native here. There are no um, native land reptiles to Hawaii. And they have uh, done pretty well and sort of taken over different parts of the island. I'm super excited to uh, have found this guy. Um, just searching around. I've wanted to find one for a while. And here we are. It's so cool and dinosaurian. I love Jackson's chameleons. And it's not just because my last name is Jackson. I'm just sort of wandering around. It's the main highway here in Volcano. And uh, I found another one. Uh, there's chameleons everywhere, apparently. Originally hailing from East Africa, Jackson's chameleons were intentionally released in 1972 and have established feral populations on several Hawaiian islands. With the long projectile tongue chameleons use to capture prey, these lizards are a deadly predator for the native invertebrate species of the islands, a kaiju of the undergrowth. Invasive species have dramatically altered the ecosystems of Hawaii and have been devastating for all of the unique animals that once called these islands home. Some invaders were accidentally brought, like the carnivorous hammerhead worm, a deadly and efficient predator of snails. Hawaii was once home to a diverse community of native snails that functioned as important decomposers and found from the forest floor to tree-dwelling species in the canopy that, according to legend, could sing. Sometime in the 1930s, though, the giant African land snail was introduced and began eating crops. So another snail, the predatory rosy wolf snail, was introduced but found the native species far more tempting of a food source and have been a contributing factor in the extinction of the beautiful native tree snails. I found this incredible aloha shirt with the shell pattern of these snails. I want this fabric. So if anyone can tell me where I can get a hand on this fabric, please contact me. After millions of years in isolation, in just the last few hundred, Hawaii is now one of the most invaded places on Earth. Many plants, even in the supposedly native forest like those on the crater rim of Kilauea, shouldn't be here. Yellow jackets glean innumerable arthropods from the vegetation, the temperate climate allowing them to persist year after year, unlike in their native western North America, where they die back with each winter. These invasive species can not only decimate native species and alter the physical habitat, but some can also be really annoying when you are trying to go to sleep. While these forests during the day still are filled with the songs of native birds like the Apapane, as the sun sets, one specific call drowns out all the chirping native crickets. The distinctive calls of the koki frog. Hailing from the island of Puerto Rico, on Hawaii they have taken over the island's night soundscape. You can barely hear the crickets or your own thoughts over the din. But of course they also devour the native arthropods munching on carnivorous caterpillars, long-jawed orb weavers, and happy face spiders, whatever they can get their jaws around. And they are so dense and numerous, there is not much anything can do to stop them now. 
The continuous introduction of new species to Hawaii is difficult to solve. The importation of exotic plants and the droves of tourists tracking who knows what on their shoes or in their luggage feeds a never-ending supply of potential invaders. That is why it is important that anyone entering these forests should spray their shoes with bleach and rub them with the brushes that are often available to hopefully minimize damage done to these fragile insular ecosystems. So, islands are strange places made by their isolation, which limits the species that colonize them and then are able to evolve to take advantage of empty niches and become just incredibly strange and unlike organisms on continental landmasses. Unfortunately, though, island species are easily threatened due to their small ranges and inability to compete with the onslaught of often continental species humans drag along to these remote places. I mean, Hawaii didn't have ants until maybe just over 100 years ago, but now they are everywhere, just like on the continents. And ants are really good at killing other insects. So will Hawaii's strange invertebrates continue to survive in an ecosystem with reptiles and the many invasive predatory arthropods? That remains to be seen, but hopefully the new Anthropocene Hawaiian ecosystem can maintain some of the charm of the island chain's long isolation. Next time. So, would you go swimming out in the open ocean in the middle of the night? You know, basically the internet's worst fear after too many Subnautica live streams. Well, I want to go see what's lurking out in water thousands of feet deep in the darkness, because apparently I lack survival instincts. Is it a good idea? I don't know.